All right, here we go. Salute to Knicks Nation. CP the Franchise here and a special edition of Knicks Fan TV joining us today. A special guest. He was a long, the longtime head athletic trainer for the New York Knicks. 27 years in the business. He is Mike Saunders. And on today's show, we're going to talk about his illustrious career plus his book, Life Sentence, which is very interesting that, that I want to talk about. Uh, Mike, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Casey. Thank you for inviting me and sharing this time with you. Absolutely. It, it's always a, a pleasure to speak to, you know, com, coming up and, and watching the Knicks, especially in the 90s. That's really how my fandom came about. And the, the best thing about sports is the unscripted nature. You know, the stories unfolding by the day and, and you, you're hanging on to, to, to those cliffhangers. But as the story unfolds, you see different characters, right? You see different characters along the bench, whether it's Coach Riley, Coach Van Gundy, all the players from Ewing on down. And you were there. You were there on that bench. And, and as he had athletic trainer, Mike Saunders, that was a name that you would hear on the telecast. You would hear it when you would go to the MSG and hear the starting lineups. And so as I've grown this channel and, and spoken to those characters who've, who've come on the show over the years, it, it's always great to, to speak to people like you as, as we, you know, uh, go into your career and, and, and talk about some of those stories of yesteryear. So it's, it's an honor to speak to you. Well, this, it's my honor to be here with you. I, I love the passion that Knicks fans have, especially in yours, case. So uh, it's great to be with you. Speaking of the Knicks, you, you joined the team in 1978, lifelong New Yorker. What was your your, your first memories? Like, what, how did you get that that job as a head athletic trainer of the Knicks? Well, you know, it's ironic. I, I graduated physical therapy school at NYU in 1977. And I went back to my old job at John Jay College as the head athletic trainer at John Jay, the criminal justice school. Uh, and I got a call from a friend of mine, Tony Saraniti, who worked at Lenox Hill Hospital. He was a physical therapist and athletic trainer, as I was. Uh, and he said, one day, I think probably in, in October or November, how would you like to be the trainer of the Knicks? And I thought he was kidding, you know. Uh, but he said, no, they're, they're looking you know, for next, you know, to, to get a new athletic trainer. Would you be interested? And I really wasn't. I, uh, I didn't have that ambition to, to do the old goal. I had I was ambitious, but I didn't have that, that goal in mind. It never occurred to me. Danny, Danny Whalen was the trainer at the time. He'd been there for, for quite a while. Um, and, you know, I was young. In, in 77 or 78, I was 25, 26 years old. I'm young. I had no responsibilities, not married, single living. And, you know, and so... You know, I didn't need that tremendous responsibility on my shoulders. Uh, but weeks passed, and he called me again and said, I'm setting up a meeting at Lenox Hill Hospital. George Veris, who was the administrator of the sports medicine. And I went there without the intention of going for the job. And when you have nothing on the line, you tend to be a little more relaxed and perhaps present yourself better. Uh, so we had you know, a few meetings, and I had meetings with Eddie Donovan, who was the general manager, with Bruce Reed, who was the coach. And things were proceeding. I don't know in what direction necessarily, but they, you know, we had the meetings. And one day I came home, opened up my mailbox, and there was a letter. From the Knicks. From the right? Knicks. Okay, your, your audio I had a out. beautiful, a beautiful... Uh, letterhead, basketball, the Nick logo, the old logo, the blue was brown, the blue, an orange, and it just blew me away. And I said, I want to work for that company. And it was basically a rejection letter. Wow. <laughs> Ironically, it said, well, we're not making any changes right now, but thank you for your interest. But the meetings continued. And I remember I was with the U.S. National Soccer Team in Puerto Rico. Mm. And I got a call from Eddie Donovan saying that when you come back to New York, see me. And I, I came back just after July 4th and I had the job. Wow. 
So that that's how it happened. It was ironic. Sometimes the things you don't pursue come to you. And, uh, and that's how that happened. Sometimes the things you don't pursue come to you. That that's a great quote. And and when you started on that job, I mean, you you served under a number of illustrious coaches with with this organization. But when you started, I, I mean, you're one of the few who have worked with some of the legendary Nick coaches from Red Holtzman to Riley to Van Gundy. What was that like interacting with a, a, a legendary coach like Red Holtzman, the, the the coach that won the championships here? Well, I understand, uh, Casey. I started with Willis Reed as the coach. Right. Willis was the coach in place in 1977-78 season. I came to 78-79 season. That was my first year. So I started with Willis, but about 14 games into the season, I was let go, and Red Holzman came back. So, so that that's what happened. But working with Willis was great. Willis, I mean, may he rest in peace. Yeah, rest in peace. Uh, he was, what, what a great person. What a great basketball player. Uh, but I worked with 13 different coaches those 27 years. Seven of them are in the Hall of Fame. So it goes to show you, you know, that uh, that I got a lot of coaches fired. A lot of great coaches fired. <laughs> I guess you can look at it that way. But uh, you know, I work with great coaches. They were they were all great and great to me. Was there was there one coach that you had the best, or would you say the easiest working relationship with? Um, they were they were all great. They they were distinct in each way. You know, each one had their own personality and way of doing things. Uh, but they were all, all super. They really were. Uh, I guess that's why they were the coach of the Knicks. You know? they, uh, they, they had a certain quality that, that attracted them to that type of job. What do you remember about that, that first game at Madison Square Garden when you served in your new role? What, what I remember was John Condon, who was the public address announcer, who was famous. You know, he had a great voice, like Bob Shepard at Yankee mm-hmm. Stadium. Mm-hmm. And him announcing my name this time was very special. Were, were you a Knicks fan growing up as a kid? I mean, you grew up in Queens. Were, were you a Knicks fan growing up? I must confess, I was not. Mm. I was a Celtics fan. Ah, that's what I, I was going to say. Oh, that, believe yeah. it or not. Yeah. Now, and what happened? Well, um, I was born in 1952, to give you some context. Mm-hmm. Um, and be- baseball was key. And growing up, we, you know, I was a Yankee fan. There were Met fans. Met fans only came in 1962. They started, and those people, their parents were probably Brooklyn Dodger fans or New York Giant fans. Uh, but baseball was king, and a friend of mine kind of brought basketball into our neighborhood. He was a Celtic fan, so I became a Celtic fan. I loved Bill Russell. He was my idol. And I, I loved all the other players on the Celtics. I, I couldn't get enough of them. When you read a lot of, of, of history on the game, you would always hear about the theatrics that they would pull in Boston when you guys were on the road. Do you remember any uh, vivid stories, any vivid accounts from from those days? Well, if, if anybody questions the, the veracity of those accusations, they were all... All true. Uh, all tr- every bit of it was true. <laughs> um, when it was cold outside in the winter time, they left the window wide open. <laughs> when the weather got warmer, they kept the windows closed. And when they were undecided, they would use the toilets and never flush. Oh, <laughs> and that, God's honest truth. Yeah. And that that happened to to me and my team. Yeah. it's not like I heard this. Yes. Yeah. So that's, they, they thought it was gamesmanship. They thought it was clever. Yeah. But it, it wasn't. It was classics. But, you know. And then sometimes, and I, I do remember, uh, fire alarm at, at the hotel. A fi- fire alarm the broke out. So, sorry, your audio was a little chippy. So that's why I just, yeah, just repeating, repeating what yeah. you said. Uh, the fire alarm would be pulled at the hotel or a bomb threat would be placed. So, you know, they thought it was clever and smart, but it wasn't. 
Man, may, makes for a tough day on the job, I have to imagine. Now, over the 27 years, you, you've uh, served in a number of players. I'm sure you get this question a lot, but is there one player who you were closest with over that time? Uh, well, let me let me preface my statement by saying I got along with all the players. And I think in life, if you give respect, you get respect back. Yeah. Yeah. That was the relationship. I, I respected the players. I worked hard for them. I cared for them and I cared about them. So, you know, there was never a problem in, in that respect. Uh, you have to also understand that when I started, I was closer to the player's age. Mm. When I was ready to retire. Some of those players had kids ready to enter into the NBA. Yeah. So I attended. So um, one of my first favorites was Bill Cartwright. Mm. Patrick Ewing. Uh, uh, Pat, Patrick's wonderful. Never misses my birthday. <laughs> my birthday. And sometimes just call, hey, Mike, how you doing? Um, again, one of my favorites and a very special person, really a gift from God, is Earl Monroe. The Pearl. Uh, yeah, Earl. We, we keep close. Touch uh, and Earl not only was one of the greatest basketball and innovators, but just a wonderful guy. When when they drafted Patrick and that that the organization was trying to regroup from the early seventies championship run, and they, they you you're going from Bernard, you get to Patrick. What was I guess your impressions when you first saw him? And did you feel like the franchise was going to start to turn the corner when, when he got there? Well, well it's a funny thing. Um, I would be, sometimes the Big East would play in the afternoon and then it's that night. Yeah. So I'd be, I'd be at the garden very early setting up and preparing and also watching a lot of Big East basketball. Remember Patrick Ewing in the locker room when I was offering on. This is when he was at Georgetown, stuff like that. And then when he got drafted by the Knicks, or well, well, actually picked in the lottery by the Knicks, Patrick thought, I knew that he'd become, be a Nick, so that's why it was nice to him. But it wasn't. <laughs> I, I would have been nice to him even if he was uh, a Celtic or... Yeah, I was very excited. And all New Yorkers celebrate. And Patrick delivered. I feel badly for him that he couldn't get a he deserved the ring because of the efforts he put in night after night. You're close with Patrick. I mean, how did you react to some of the, the I, I guess, the friction between him, the fans, him, the media? How did you feel about that as, as his career yeah. went, went uh, you know, as, as he wrapped up? Yeah. Um, I wish the relationship was better between Patrick and the fans. Uh, but many times... It's a two-way street. Patrick, at the beginning, well, he's a shy person by nature. So he was shy and, and perhaps coming, and he was perhaps protected a little bit more at Georgetown. Uh, but when you come to New York, I don't care how much protection you have, you know, you're going to be exposed. Patrick wasn't used to it. So he didn't allow the fans into his world. So the fans didn't really understand who Patrick was. Yes, yeah, so certainly un unfortunate. Uh, I feel like posthumously, the fans will always love the legends. But while they're here and, and on the grind, and, and as you said, he, he gave it his all every single night. It was certainly contentious at the end and then seeing him traded traded to to seattle that was that was a little bit uh that was a little tough to see see him coming back in a sonics and an orlando magic uniform oh you're so right about that but but again just for the truth patrick wanted to trade he insisted on being traded it's mm. not like we wanted to trade him we did not mm. uh we did everything possible but patrick wanted to be traded so, and I, I and I think I'm not speaking out of school when I say he has publicly said that he regrets that mm. that that move being traded. For 
And I think the relationship now between him and Knicks fans in New York is much, much better. I think it's great now. Yeah. Uh, people are, people see now how great his teams were uh, and how hard he and and they understand him a bit better. Yeah. And once again, we're talking to longtime Knicks head athletic trainer, Mike Saunders, CP the Franchise here. Salute to everybody in the chat. Hit the like button, hit the share button, and subscribe to the channel. Uh, Mike, what were you've seen a lot of great days there at the Garden. What were some of your favorites, some of your favorite memories at MSG? In 1994, we got to the finals. Okay. But when we beat, I think it was Indiana, in the Eastern Conference Finals, and me finally getting to the finals was probably the most exciting. The finals are special. Nobody else is playing except you and the Western Conference finalist. There are no out-of-town scores going. You know, no one else is playing. The whole world is watching. That's very exciting and just so excited to get there. That was beating Indiana at home. What was the the ninety four game seven loss? What what went through your head that day? It's it's interesting because I've spoken to John Starks, I've spoken to Derek Harper, I've spoken to Mike Breen about their perspective. Well, how about yours? Well, I you know I, I remember the game of course. Uh, disappoint. I, I, I you know I kept certain statistics. You know foul. Player fouls, team fouls, a lot of things like that. But I also kept the score by quarter. And I realized we were down one point at the end of the first period, down two points at the end of the second, down three points. They were three po- one down, down three better. points. Down three points at the end of the third. At the end of the third, okay. right. Okay. So so we they were only one point better per than we were, so it's close. Um, but you know, we couldn't get it done. That happened. But I do remember right home the next. Day. You you remember the ride home the next day? Yes. And I went to Pat Pat Riley sitting in the back, and I sat down with Pat. And I and I I heard stories about the Lakers and how close they were, and I never felt. The Knicks were that close. And I said to Pat, Pat, my biggest regret is that the players didn't grow to really love each other. Hmm. He says, that's not necessary. What's necessary is they respect each other. Um, I, I think we respected each other, but we, I didn't see the, the great camaraderie that I think other teams had. You never know. Yeah. So you, as, as an outsider, you, you're not always privy to really what's going on. It's it's, it's interesting, you know, Riley's perspective on it, because it seemed like he tried at various times to, to bring the team together in order to, to accomplish their goals. And you think about the... Um, the fight between uh, uh, X Men and Anthony Mason in training camp in, in, at at the Citadel, or the trip to Reno. Uh, yeah, I the remember 90- the trip to Reno very well. Right, but it wasn't our own plan at the time. Mm. It was part of the uh, MGM spots. And Pat called me back. He says, "Mike, tell the pilot we want to go to Tahoe." So I go up, tell the pilots, you know, Pat wants to go to Tahoe. They said, you can't go to Tahoe. The runway is too small for our plane. I said, let's go to Reno. So I set up uh, a hotel casino, the Pepper Mill Hotel and Casino in Reno. Had limousines for us. And, and you, uh, set, you set all this up? From the plane. Wow. Okay. Okay. And, and Pat loved to say it was a crescent of limo waiting for us on, on the tarmac. Meeting. Players had no idea what was going on. Rock had no idea. We were off the grid, wow. so to speak. So we went. Pat gave every, his own money, $10,000. Wow. 
gave, I guess, 20 people $500 in chips, including the player. $500, maybe, maybe I shouldn't say this. We also had a tremendous fight in Phoenix when Greg Anthony right. came off the bench in that ugly shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and now, we went 15 and 0 for March. Wow. After that, we won our next 15 games. We went 15 and 0 for March. Wow. So I guess it worked. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. And, and all the way to the finals, and you just wish uh, wish the ball would bounce a, a one way or the another and, and into the Knicks' favor. Hopefully we would have been uh, celebrating there. You know, there, there's so many what-ifs in, in Knicks history, it's 94 being being one for sure. Is there any other that, that sticks in your mind where you say, man, this 27-year career, what if such and such you know, happened? I, 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 I don't look back at those things. I have no regrets whatsoever. I do remember watching, I guess, Cleveland versus Chicago in the playoffs. And the winner would play us. And Cleveland was maybe a better team than, than Chicago was at that time or had more success. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of rooting for Chicago to win. I thought we had a better chance at Chicago, but we didn't. We lost. I think back then it was two out of three. Two out of three, best of five. You know, fans may not remember. You know, the, the first round, the, the top team got a bye. Mm. Then, you, then the other team, two out of three, then three out of five, then four out of seven. Four out of seven. That's how it went back then. Mm. Now it's four out of seven every round, maybe a little long, but so, you know, I, I remember that, you know, for Chicago to, to, to win, so be careful what you wish for. Who's the fiercest rival? Was it Chicago? Was it Boston? Was it Miami? Was it the Pacers? From your vantage point, with the players going at it and, and the physicality of the game, what, what did you feel like was, was your fiercest rival? Well, each one was a fierce rival in its time. Um, I guess the Boston one initially was my first rivalry, and we had we hadn't won in Boston Garden, especially a playoff game, in a long time. Uh, and we finally lost in Mo Cheeks. I had a, a great game, and he led us to victory up in Boston to beat them. So, you know, that put Boston out of the way. Uh, Indiana was a great rivalry. The fans were very rabid fans in Indiana, and, you know, there was no love loss for Reggie Miller and all that. So that was a, a great rivalry at the time. Um, but Miami, you know, with Pat and without, and with Pat on the other side of the bench, you know, uh, that was, those were great rivalries, great games. I didn't care who was up by 20 points at some point in the game. We knew it was going to come down. Wow, finish. Perhaps the last shot. Yeah. We had some good fights. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the fight the fight where, uh, where Coach Van Gundy grabbed my leg. Yeah. That's a legendary <laughs> fight. You know, we, we had our shot. Yeah. So... So when you go from, you know, Greg Anthony in the Hawaiian shirt, brawling in Phoenix, you got Harper and JoJo White, several Knicks Heat fights. Did you and, and you get you're in the middle. You're jumping off the bench. You got to play peacemaker at some points. As you said, you you might have to coordinate travel. And I mean, did you, did you ever reflect on those moments? Like, man, I might need to change change the scenery. This this is hectic. No, oh no, no. That was part of the excitement of the job. But you do what you have to do. Yeah. Um. And again, one of my roles was, especially when the commissioner made the rule, if you come off the bench. Onto the court, even take one step onto the court, you're suspended for the next game. So my role was to keep players on the bench. That's what I did. Just it's a good thing that most punches in the NBA are never connected. Never land. <laughs> Thank God for that. Or else there'd be a lot of injuries. Yeah.
Why? No, no, um, no question about it. No, no question about it. There were a lot of injuries, a lot of flailing, not much connected. Yeah, yeah. Thank God. Yeah. Thank God. <laughs> who, who did you feel like, like during that that '90s run? You had captains, like you once a captain. I think one time they had tri captains with like Ewing, Oakley, and Starks. Who did you feel like was that glue in the locker room that the guys would lean on in a tough spot? Five game losing streak. You know, we got to get it together. Who was that guy to try to keep the locker room you know, intact? I'm not sure. Patrick did it in his own way, mm. but um, I'm not sure. Patrick certainly did it by example. Like mm. always playing hard in his heart out. Mm. But I'm not sure we had that. And that's one reason why I don't think got as far as we did sometimes. How, how did uh, how did you <clears throat> how would you compare Riley's leadership style to, to Van Gundy? Um they they came from different places. Pat came from a uh, DNA of winning championships and looking the way he did in the image he projected. Jeff used him being kind of an outsider, never playing in the NBA and being short in stature. He played that to his advantage and was a great coach. And, and I'll tell you what, if I was hiring a coach today, I'd be knocking on Jeff's door. Coach Van Gogh, you say, come on, let, let's let's get back to it. But he's he's a great, great coach. When, when once again, we're talking a long time. Head athletic trainer for the New York Knicks, Mike Saunders, CP the franchise here. Salute to everybody in the chat. Hit the like button, hit the share button, and subscribe to the channel. Special edition of Knicks Fan TV. Uh, and Mike, with the, the 99 team, they, they went through... It was such a roller coaster season with the 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 Starks and Sprewell trade, the slow start, uh, Van Gundy's job questionable on, on the line. They they make the AC. Did you were you as surprised as, as many in that run that that they had in ninety nine? Just given all that had happened in, in that season, KC. If I'm not mistaken, that was also the lockout shortened season yes. into the lockout. Yes. Um, so although I think we were 25 and 25, I think it was a 50 game season, we were in eighth place, but I didn't look at us as an eighth place team. Mm. And I'm not sure, I think when we got Sprewell, I don't think he started right away or played bench. right away. I think he had some Achilles tendonitis, if I recall. Mm -hmm. My memory's not great with that stuff, mm -hmm. by the way. But um, so, you know, we started slowly and you know, made the playoffs, and then we kept winning. A couple other players I, I want to get your opinion on, because I, especially this one, because I, I never saw him play, and I just don't feel like there's enough singing of his praises. Bernard, Bernard King. King. Bernard King. Of course. That, yeah. I, I know that's true. You know? Yeah. Bernard, you know, I always describe Bernard as half athlete, half artist. Mm. Was truly an artist on the court. His moves, uh, that quick one-handed shot. Nobody got the shot off. And again, what a fierce competitor mm. Bernard was. He was unbelievable. I still keep in touch with. Him. Mm. Love Bernard. You can't help love the effort that that he made. Um, and you talk about his game face, you know, which he's just he is totally focused. For the game, you didn't mess with him whatsoever. Mm. Just focused on the game that was about to go on. Uh, I remember we were playing the Nets, and Bernard's brother Albert was on the Nets, and I saw Albert. And Albert, how you doing? I said, Bernard, but and Albert said, I saw Bernard, but I didn't say hello. Mm. He had his game face on, so even his brother. Wouldn't even mess, you know, and <laughs> Bernard, you know, before the game. Staff focused. Yeah. And, but he was unbelievable. Uh, unfortunately, he had the anterior cruciate ligament. ACL. ACL. Yep. yep. Uh, but he returned. He was, I think, probably the first 
NBA player to return from that, and he returned to an all-star caliber player. Bernard was special, very special. But again, half artist, half athlete. Half artist, half athlete. It was just incredible. Yeah. I, well, I think one of my earlier what ifs, and and I don't know if, if you well, you can let me know if you remember what the thought process was. But how did the franchise feel when they drafted Ewing? Like, was there hopes that these two could come together oh, and form no a team? No question. That, no question. No, that would have been a, a, an awesome truth. One, two, no question. It didn't really happen, unfortunately. Yeah. But that was that was the grand plan. That would have been wonderful, for sure. And then, yeah. and unfortunately, it never got to uh, never got to see that through. And, and Ewing never really had a true Robin who who, who could match his level of stardom. Unfortunately, right. yeah. yeah. Um, other players played well, but uh, probably were never that great. Uh, be the side man, Patrick. Yeah. How about the X Man? He, he's a fan favorite. He was on the, on this yeah. show. Uh, I I don't think there's a more beloved Nick that was here for one year than Xavier McDaniel. So many. Yeah. He, he's another what if Knicks fans say, hey, if we would have had him in '93 or '94, we would have we would have won it. We needed to keep him. They they hated that X Man went to the Celtics. What, what, what was your thoughts on X Man back then? Yeah, yeah, I loved X Man. We got along really well. He was he was as tough as they come. Also, he was as tough a guy as as, as anybody in the league, and I I loved him. He and as you know because you had him on the show, great personality, great personality, he was just bubbly and great. He tells it like it is. And, and, and you also served as head athletic trainer in the 96 and 98 All-Star Game, the 98 game uh, being held here at, at Madison Square Garden. How, how did you get those honors? Because at that time, well, you know, there were, there were no Knicks on the coaching staff. How did you get that honor? Yeah. Uh, the coaches are decided upon who was in first place at a certain time of the, of the season before the All-Star Game. Trainers go on a rotation basis. So I was there in 86. 86 in uh, Dallas. Mm-hmm. That was my first. Just my rotation came up. Oh, okay. Okay. And then I was there in 98 because I was the host. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. So that's why I got that. How much did uh, did Jordan get on you in 98 when 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 you had to work with him and he's and he's in the garden? Oh, that was, gets that, the that, was, that was great. Yeah, that was great. Uh, what's interesting, I handed out the checks after the game to the players the winner's share the game checks the winner's share yeah i i gave out the checks and i remember uh michael saying oh i can i can fill my cars up with gas now (laughs) i I remember i remember that (laughs) oh man i'm sure he he was a trip i i could fill all my cars up with gas now that that's incredible so they actually have the physical game checks that you hand out to, to each team at the end of the game. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. That's incredible. I wonder how they do it now. And maybe they just get like, I have to imagine they get like a direct deposit. I mean. Oh, maybe a Brinks truck. Yeah. Back up a Brinks <laughs> truck. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm sure the money's a lot more now than it was then. But uh, yeah, you know. Uh, also- wait, Casey, if I may interrupt Yeah, yeah you. sure, sure. How about, I think each player if they win this in-season tournament, I think it's five hundred thousand dollars. Five hundred thousand dollars. How about that? How about that? Five hundred. I'd, I'd like. I'd like to give out those checks. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> five hundred thousand trip to Vegas in the middle of the season. So you know, in the middle of the grind, you go to Sid City and you get five hundred thousand. That, that's not a not a bad deal. What, what do you think about the the game today? Uh, I mean, you you worked in a time when it was said that the game was you know super physical, and a lot of people think that the rules adjustments. Catered, catering towards today's game, the '90s Knicks impacted that a lot. What, what do you think about that and, and today's game? Well, well, I I I love the physical cap, the physicality of the game because that's how the Knicks play. So I, I I got to see it and embrace it. Um, and 
occasionally those type of games are played in the NBA, especially in the playoffs where the refs let them play a little bit more without calling a lot of fouls. And I love those games. Yeah. It's a throwback for me to watch the physicality. And I love that. I think that's how the game should be played. Um, I, I, I'm i not the one to say, oh, you know, the game is terrible today. It was going to go to my time. No, I think the game is great. Played by great athletes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think two things that have hurt the game a little bit is rely, reliance on the three-point shot. Mm. Because you see a lot of misses, too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the fact that players don't spend three or four years in college really getting those uh, mature those basics. Yeah, the fundamentals. Down. Yeah, the fundamentals, exactly. So that's... Uh, I think those two things have impacted the game negative, negatively, but... Uh, it's still a great game. How, how about uh, today's Nick team? You got a chance to see them, the Knicks in Miami? Oh, yeah, just, yeah. Just oh, yeah. What, I watch them. Uh, Any time I can watch them, I watch them. I think they're terrific. Now, I had a close-up seat last year in the playoffs when the Knicks lost to Miami. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Jalen Brunson is a force out there. I had his father, Rick, yeah, as a player. yeah. yeah. And I remember he used to drill little Jalen. <laughs> he used to drill a little, you know, but he's he's a, a, an all-star in, in every respect, at, on and off the court. He's a great person. I say kid. I, I shouldn't say that. He's a great person. No, they're not, they're not kids. Uh, but uh, he's great and great player. Uh, Tom Thibodeau is a great coach. I had him as, <clears throat> as an assistant coach. Um, yeah, so they have a lot of talent there. Uh, and they have a chance to go very far to the playoffs. Yeah, yeah, it's look, looking good so far. Certainly looking good so far. And, <clears throat> you know, another topic that has come up is, uh, over the last couple of years recently is the the topic of load management. You have the teams now, they have a number of personnel, they have analytics, they have the sensor devices, and and they're breaking down the player from everything, from sleeping to eating to everything that they're doing and trying to manage their availability accordingly. Now, you have the league who's saying, you know, we've got to sell to the TV partners, we we need these guys on the court, there's no such thing as load management, it doesn't impact, uh, you know, player injuries, what do you think about that? As a, as the former head athletic trainer of the Knicks, what do you think about the whole load management debate right now in the NBA? I'm not quick to discard it and saying it's nonsense. There's probably some science behind it, but that doesn't necessarily dictate how players should play and when they should play. They may not be at their optimal in terms of performance, I don't think it would necessarily impact the potential for injury. If it does, that's one thing. Mm. I don't think it really always impacts the potential for an injury to it. So, uh, look, I remember as a fan, <clears throat> teams used to play three nights in a row. Mm. And I think, I think I used to watch the Knicks on a Saturday night at Madison Square Garden. And I attended games at the Old Garden. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> say the Knicks and Celtics would play Saturday night at the Garden. They would take a train up to Boston and play there Sunday afternoon. Mm-hmm. And they didn't have uh, all of the extras that players have today to perform at their maximum. Yeah, yeah. You know, they had one coach, some not even assistant coach. They had one coach, one trainer. That was it. Mm-hmm. That was the support staff. Players used to have to carry and wash their own uniforms <laughs> back in the day. And they played three in a, three nights in a row or three days in a row. And the game was more physical. Mm. And there was hand checking and everything. And certainly, I think you'll agree, they got paid a lot less yeah. than the players yeah, yeah, yeah. paid today. And they didn't have you know, charter flights all the time. They had, they had to take, you know, get on a plane with, with you know, everybody else. 
cramped up. They didn't have a lot of first class. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the conditions back then were certainly le way less than ideal. And they played and, and they great. But that doesn't mean that today the players are babies. They're not. But, you know, I, I think something can be good can be taken to the extreme and become negative. That's my feeling. Fair point. Fair point. And once again, we are talking to uh, the longtime head athletic trainer of the New York Knicks, 27 years. Mike Saunders joins us. And Mike has a book out. It is called Life Sentence. Uh, Mike, to talk about Life Sentence, and w well, first off, what made you come out with the book? Well, you know, I, when I would go into somebody's clubhouse or locker room, wherever it may be, I may see a motivational quote up on the walls. And I would write it down, usually on the back of a business card, and put in a business card holder, periodically look at it. I guess I'm susceptible to quotes and, and motivational sayings. So I would accumulate these, put them in a business card holder, look at it periodically, say, wow, you know, this is too powerful to keep to myself. I have to share it. Mm. And I thought the best way to do that was to compile. I collected 680 quotes and 18 great stories mm. to motivate, inspire, and empower people. Uh, and my target audience was family, young people mm. and athletes. So let me... This is the book, yep. Life Sentence. Mm -hmm. If if anybody listening would like to purchase it, mm -hmm. um, the book is fifteen dollars plus three dollars for shipping and handling. Okay. That price has gone up. The post office charges yeah. about a dollar more now, but yeah. I kept the price the same. Um, now Venmo, they want to do it by Venmo, eighteen dollars to life sentence book. Life sentence, okay. Life sentence book. What if they want to send a check to P Life Sentence, mm -hmm. PO Box four eight zero one two three. Four four eight zero one two three. Correct. Okay. And and that's Delray Beach, Florida, three three four four eight. Okay. All right. So so, sounds if good. anybody's interested, I, I and it makes a great gift. It's the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. To be honest with you. Uh, and you don't have to read the open the book and start at page one and go you know, to the end. No, you can just open it up to any page, and I'm sure something there will resonate. Yeah, that that's what I did, and and I appreciate my copy. And and what I do is, you know, every once in a while, a day or two, I'll just kind of just flip to a random page, take a look at something, get some inspiration. Get back grounded. You know, a lot of times you, you read these quotes, it kind of brings you back into the middle, puts things in perspective, depending on what's going on in, in a hectic day. So I, I think it's a great it's a great resource and a great tool to have. It's a great idea by you. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. But, you know, I mentioned earlier in our conversation, Casey, uh, that I like to give back to the Like and to give back to the community. Way. Right, exactly. And this is one way to that on a grand scale to create this book to motivate a lot of people and as i said the reaction is always great great reaction what well, you've got over 600 quotes in there is there a favorite is there one that sticks out that one that you you live by well, well i well there's so many great quotes in there and as i go through the book occasionally i find one that i forgot and i said wow got you. you know that's great but I, I say my mantra is, I quote John Wooden, the great coach at UCLA, uh, and his quote, and I have multiple quotes by him, by the way, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. but the one that I live by is, make every day your masterpiece. Make every day your masterpiece. Exactly. And that's that's how I try to live my life. When I wake up in the morning, you know, I want to create my masterpiece of the day and do everything the right way. Do everything the right way and, and living a life uh, with full intentions and, and having your days, as you said, uh, just just to make it a, make it a masterpiece, make it a good one, and, and try to try to improve every day and, and as you say, give back to the community. So 
Uh, I like that one. As you said, there's a number of wooden quotes in there. You've got some Jordan quotes, Ali. So go to some good ones. Well, I'm Martin Luther King. I have Nelson Mandela. Yeah. I have Aristotle. I, ha- I have so many people. There you go. There you and, go. Yeah. And, yeah. And it's, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's worthy for someone to, to invest in themselves, get the book. And I think it'll uh, help improve their lives. For sure. For sure. So, so Mike, a- after an illustrious 27-year career, as you reflect on that, you, how, how do you want to be remembered? Well, I, 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 I'm I, not maudlin. I'm not morose. Mm-hmm. I don't think about what's on my tombstone. Mm-hmm. But I would say he, he cared for his players and he cared about his players. And I think that sums up my career. I really cared about them. Uh, I would I would hope that they all have a great life after basketball. Uh, you know, that's a, a small part of your life because as you spend, you know, if, if you're lucky to play until you're 40, which rarely you do, you have a lot of years. That's only less than half of projected lifetime. So I want them to have a great life after basket. Uh, be productive, be happy. I take great pleasure with my family. Uh, my daughter Ashley uh, has three children. Mm-hmm. My, my three grandchildren, who I adore. And my son Jeffrey works for the Miami Heat. Very proud of him. I've been married 41 years, very happily. Congratulations. So, you know, I, I wouldn't change play, places with anybody. I really would. They, they, no, that, that sums it up for me. Hey, so, some sums it up nicely. And, and Mike, as I started the show to say, I, I appreciate the characters from those stories that were unfolding before me as a young kid, young New Yorker growing up and, and cherishing my New York sports teams. Uh, it was an honor and a privilege to speak to you. Hopefully you come back on the show. Maybe we get another uh, a Knicks-Heat rivalry, maybe another playoff rematch, and you can come, come on the show and, and, and recap with us. That'd be fun. Casey, you have my phone number. I'm a, I'm a call away. Whatever, whatever you need, you let me know. There's been a lot of fun. It's just been great to reminisce with you. So I don't do that all the time. Yeah. There's certain things I forget, and you know. But as I said, all my memories are great memories. Of time. It's not like I'm trying to forget anything. Yeah. It's always great. Um. So, but it's it's great reminiscing with you, and I I love your passion, basketball and the Knicks, and your knowledge of it. So uh, it's a treat to be on with. You. Well, that well, thank you, and and now we got one one for the archives, and, and one that we can we can replay uh, over the course of time. So, Mike, thanks again. Have a great one, and, and good luck. And for those of you at home, make sure you get that book, Life Sentence, Life Sentence, great book of inspirational quotes. Uh, once again, Mike Saunders, legendary head athletic athletic trainer of the New York Knicks of twenty seven years. Thank you guys for tuning in, and we'll see you guys next time.